So, um, tricks to explore or improve web app Excel export. Actually, Owen was on about me getting a title, so th this may not actually reflect the <laughs> presentation whatsoever now. But uh, um, so, actually, most of you know me, so <laughs> I won't really bother with this slide. But uh, but there you go. <laughs> well, I, won't, I won't bother with that. So, by way of an agenda, yeah. So basically, the idea is, I mean, obviously, when writing this and this being the inaugural cam set, I didn't really know what kind of audience I was going to have. Obviously, hundreds have turned out. Um, I've, if you're watching this on the video, that might you might not believe it, but there are hundreds. Um, so, by way of an agenda, I started off with just a uh, web app Excel export, like a one page. Let's just make sure that we're on the same sheet, and then uh, a few general tricks. You know, just things to look out for and responses. Some of that just is just general web app security. Then we're going to focus on the DDE trick, which is a couple of years old now. Um, but then, you know, something that I tried to do was just trying to Im improve the attack. And, you know, I found one or two things, and it's, this is where it gets a bit open-ended, and, and it's really just like a presentation of, of what I did and, and you know, where, where it may go and, and you know, uh, sort of cry for help, really. Uh, maybe others can pick it up. So, um, so obviously, you know, most of you would have seen a web application where you're submitting data to it, that data is stored, and elsewhere in the application you can um, export that data. Usually you know, you'll get some kind of reporting function and then it'll say, do you want to export this? And it'll, it'll pop up in CSV, XLS, or XLSX. And the interesting part here is that the user has some control over the contents of that, um, of that spreadsheet. Usually there's some kind of template, you know, where, uh, which is sort of fixed and is written by the app. Um, and then your user data populates certain fields, and that's where things get interesting. Now and again, you do get some really weird variations. I've seen ones where you get um, the export function work, where the data is sent back to the client, and then it gets posted back up to the application, and that's sent back as a CSV, and some all sorts of weird things going on, and they can be vulnerable to other things, but we're just going to take the general case here. So hopefully we're all on the same page now. So just as an example, imagine you're sending a request like this to, the, uh, to an export, page and you get back some headers and you start to, you know, you, uh, you, you know, you get your CSV file starting there. So what's of interest here? What do you think? <laughs> Going into training mode. <laughs> <laughs> so some, any, any general web app stuff, any general, sorry? So first of all, yeah, you've got some header disclosure going on there. Yeah, yeah, anything else? What could be of interest in? Given this, we're getting this. Yep, so you potentially, you know, we've got 2016 up here, we've got 2016 here it's and here. It's a CSV file, but the contents might be different. Yeah, so potentially there's some fun to be had there. I'll come on to why that may or may not be the case. Um, that doesn't always work quite smoothly. And of course, if you've got that, there's a potential for this to be interpreted as HTML, which can get interesting. Uh, in this case, you're going to have problems because of this, but yeah. Anything else? Yeah, might be able to play with this, absolutely. That's good, so I'll just sort of fly through. So um, first of all, it's HTTP as well, so you know, watch out for that. Um, as we talked about, these parameters here, um, potentially we've got control here and here. So this could include um, injecting headers um, as well, because we're in obviously the header section here. Plus we've got control of um, the file itself um, and the format. Um, as we mentioned, server headers um, and the version header, that's actually now unsupported, uh, that version of ASP. Um, text, ex uh, text HTML, someone mentioned. Um, we'll look into that. Cache control header is public. So if this is a report, it could have some sensitive information in it, and that could be cached by the browser. Um, so that's something to look at too. And just another area, of, presumably, you know, that being my name, that's something that I have control of probably in the web app. That's another area that I could potentially have control in the, in the CSV file. So, I mean, there's lots of little points here to look at. Plus, you were only editing that about two and a half hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, some things to look out for. We've covered it, some of it already, but um, some other things as well. So, force the format. So, there was an F equals XLS or CSV. You know, you can play around with that. CSV can have some interesting side um, or benefits to, uh, for our attacker. Uh, alternatively, that may be exposed through um, sort of, uh, in the URIs, you know, app export XLS, you may be able to swap that to CSV or PDF or other ways. You know, if people are making use of libraries for their import, um, for the export functions, they may not really be too sure of what or may not be aware of what they're actually 
um, exposing in terms of functionality because they've just got the library in there to do one job but they don't, may not realise what else is going on and obviously if you can detect a library you may, there may be some vulnerabilities around that. Um, unauthenticated access um, so you know just making sure that that um, process does actually enforce authentication. Um, content type was incorrect as someone mentioned uh, so potential for XSS but you if you get a content disposition attachment header going in then that's going to spoil it because it'll prompt the browser to say you must download it. Um, header injection so there was a portion of the um, content disposition header that we potentially had control of around here um, so by using the right um, sort of payload there we might be able to write some uh, an extra header and whether that's useful or not will depend on some other vulnerabilities and the cache control directive quite often see actually that being weaker than the rest of the application so the main application may be you know no store no cache etc but the but file downloads can often be can often be weaker uh, whether that's useful or not will still depend on what's being downloaded and and, and, the, and the browser um, so if, if that header is there then the browser may not may not cache it um, and you know that's just going to depend on the, on the browser and some other factors so the DDE trick um, is another thing to try. So we talked about um, earlier that there were some fields potentially in, in the web app that we had control over um, that when they came to be exported would appear in a, in a CSV file or some kind of spreadsheet. So that's of interest um, particularly for this trick, DDE trick. Now dynamic data exchange, which is what DDE um, expands to, is an old Microsoft technology. Yonks, really old, really old. F facilitates data transfer between applications and is a form of inter-process communication, which we'll see, hopefully, if the demos work. So the security risks of this were first publicized, and it was actually only a, few, you know, a couple of years ago, by James Kettle, who tweets as that, uh, who now works for Portswigger. Uh, and this was the original um, article on the, on, on the topic. So the basic idea is consider a spreadsheet, spreadsheet cell uh, with this as its value, equals CMD, pipe and you see that for yourself. So this is the basic structure of a um, DDE call in, um, in, in sort of Excel format with a, with a pipe and, a, and an exclamation mark as a sort of delimiter where you have a service, a topic and an item. So you imagine that some DDE server program has registered itself, with, if you like, with the operating system saying, hello, well, this is my service and, and then this is the way that you can inter interact with it. So that's the service, that's the topic and that's the item. Now of course which is called the sort of DDE trick, but there is no DDE service called CMD. So Excel just go, so Excel will make that call, we'll try and find if there is something called CMD out there, sort of listening for instructions, we'll fail, and we'll just go, well, in the absence of that, I'll just sort of run it. I'll just, you know, let's just, I'll just run this and, and you know, see where we go. So it'll, it'll, what it'll do is, is, is offer to run that program and hope that that will solve the problem. And of course, this being CMD, .exe, you'd then you know get the calculator fire up, and of course you know you can just have some fun with other uh, other 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 options which we'll sort of I explore along the way. But you know at the point that you get the code execution, you know the, the paths there are, are, are well known, and, and so that's not really what this is about. You know it's a, it's the this is really about getting to the point that you get the command running. Because this doesn't just happen automatically, as you can imagine. You know, there are some warnings that come up before, the, before you, you start you know, running executables out of uh, Excel spreadsheets, as you would hope. So the typical warnings would first of all be this. You've downloaded something from the internet. It'll then come up and say, you know, are you sure you want to have a look at this? So you, you, you enable. Um, you then get a couple of uh, other warnings, uh, depending on the context. So probably the first time you run the file, you'll get a, this sort of security warning. Um, and, and then possibly later you might get this kind of warning because the file has been trusted at this point. You're actually making registry entries when you, when you click these. So um, Excel uh, will remember you know, that, you, that you're happy with that file. And then uh, if you open it again, it'll then uh, ask you if you want to update the, the links. Um, uh, and if that hasn't been enabled to, uh, to, to happen automatically, then it'll ask you th this question. So you'll get different sort of flavors of dialogue box there. And then lastly, as it says, remote data not accessible. So there is no sort of DDE call that's working. So, you know, it'll try starting an app, uh, another application. Do you want to run cmd.exe? So, you know, some of these um, are probably quite likely to be clicked through because if you think about the original context where you've got someone using a web app 
and they're, they're making it, uh, an export of a, of a report or you know, whatever it may be. You know, they have actually voluntarily done it themselves. You know, this is typically a sort of stored attack. You know, so you put your payload up there in the app, it's there, it's ready for someone to just you know, um, to, to hit it. So they've requested the download. So it's quite likely that they're going to click through these because they've, they've done it. You know, this hasn't been forced on them. Uh, you know, they've, they've generated the, the export, they've, they've asked for it. So yeah, they're going to click through, through these. Whether they get down to here and start being suspicious, and you know, ring up the IT security department and say, I think, I've, I think there's a problem. Yeah, well, you know, not too sure about that. Um, these are some statistics from um, an in, uh, internal um, phishing platform uh, at NCC. So I asked someone to put together some statistics for the percentage of people that click through warnings. So the, this particular kind of uh, attack where we've got a spreadsheet. Now, in this case, it has macros. Now, DDE and macro are completely separate. So, which is interesting from a red team point of view and, and you know, generally from web app point of view uh, for this particular time, kind of attack because if you disable macros, this, this will still work. Um, so, but anyway, just for the statistics, um, this was about spreadsheets and, and macros. So, um, the difference being, you know, we could tell whether someone's opened the spreadsheet or opened it and enabled the macro. Now, obviously, we don't really have visibility of how many warnings there were, et cetera, but we know that they've got, you know, so, to the point that they've enabled the macro. So, you know, Pretty good there, pretty good there. Not so lucky there, but that's, that's, the, that's the game. So we know that people will click through warnings, and particularly, as I say, in this context, because they might be expecting, expecting it. So where do these warnings come from? What are the sources of, um, of these? Oh, by the way, this was, this was the setting of someone that, uh, that I know in the financial sector. So <laughs> because uh, you know, sometimes there are sp spreadsheets flying around They've all got macros in, and so they just enable it. You know? So obviously in that case, they're not going to get any warnings whatsoever. So you may be lucky and hit someone like that. Um, and that's where a case of targeting might be useful. I mean, Owen's presentation about sort of targeting and getting the right person, you know, you know, that, could, uh, that could really help you out with your attack. But that's kind of a more of a you know, red team sort of exercise um, rather than web app export that I'm talking about. Okay, so back to the, the source of the, uh, the warning. So in the trust center, um, which is a sort of common set of settings for Office uh, documents. You've got um, settings for protected view, which are obviously all on uh, by default. Um, but for the, and the, the external content, which is where we're talking about this, there are links in here. Do you want to enable them? Um, they're set to prompt, which is obviously why we've got the prompt. And so while I was looking at this, there's an interesting um, um, area of the properties for a, for a particular file. So if you open a file um, and it has one of these links in it, if you go to the data, edit links, um, startup prompt menu, it then says, when this workbook is opened, Excel can ask whether or not to update links to other workbooks. So the default is let users choose, but there is an option, don't display the alert and update the links automatically. So the spreadsheet itself can contain a setting which says, don't ask the user about updating links, just update them. Um, which sounds cool, you know, it sounds like, you know, a, a malicious packet flying through the network with the, with the evil bit set to off, you know, it's just, uh, it's just going to work. However, unfortunately, life is not that good for us as, um, uh, as pen testers because while it is a setting of the, of the file, so it will follow the file, it's only effective if the file has been previously trusted. So you remember there were two warnings in the, that I uh, showed up in that second category. Um, one would, would, would comes up when you first see the file, now, if that setting is set subsequently, then you won't get any more warnings about it. So you still will still get one warning the first time you run the file. You just won't get the warnings the, the second, third, fourth, five, you know, fifth, sixth time. Um, this, you know, may be useful for a low and slow attack because you could have a benign payload which doesn't do anything so sort of suspicious. Um, and then the second time you present that um, uh, export, then maybe something, you know, malicious will happen, um, which, you know, for which there'll be no warnings. Um, so in the context of a web app which is storing data and people are downloading regular reports, you know, you, 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 you could actually engineer that. You know, you could have something benign for month one and then put in something uh, for, for, for month two. But anyway. So what happens when you're trusting these documents? You get these warnings saying, you know, protected view. You're getting a warning saying there's some content here which uh, is sort of dynamic. What do you want me to do? You know, enable, enable. Well, um, the... Um, there's an area in the registry um, that, um, that covers this, so when you, you, know, you click 
a protected view, you get one change when you, when you click the, the second warning about enabling content, you get, a, you get a second change. This is a big binary blob, I have no idea what it does. <laughs> uh, I think there are one or two records um, uh, there for, um, particularly with forensics, because it shows that someone's opened it, um, which you know, could, could, be, could be interesting. So I think there are one or two sort of articles, but no, no one really has an idea of what it does. Probably even Microsoft doesn't really know what it does. That documentation is long lost. So, um, so that's, where it, that's where it lives. Now, what's of interest here um, is that it's a, it's a file path. So it's just a file. There's no, there's only the file name is stored. So that the security, if you like, you know, that this file is trusted is only based on the file name. That's it. So where you're having downloads with static file names, because it's a monthly report and it comes down always as monthreport.xls, once you've trusted it once, all the future ones will be trusted as well. Um, so that's a kind of interesting um, sort of, uh, point there. And once the file is trusted, as I mentioned, if that file is carrying that property which says don't warn the user, then you've actually lost the first warning, the second warning, and now we've just got the third warning, which is do you want, in our case, like cmd.exe to run or you know, whatever. So, so we're sort of cutting down the warnings in, by doing that. I just sort of have a poke around to seeing whether the file format would have any influence over the number of warnings, um, because that can be under our influence. Uh, you know, you, there might be the file type um, defined by a parameter that you have control of. You might be able to flick it to something else which is more favorable. So interestingly, with CSV, you get no protected view warning at all. It's almost like CSVs are trusted. They're just text files with, with commas. But, so you get no protected view warning when you open a CSV uh, file, even if it comes from the internet. So sort of a downside from that, um, if you're going for that sort of low and slow attack, is that you, it can't contain that startup prompt sort of setting because it isn't clever enough. It's just a text file. So that kind of data about itself doesn't exist with CSV, so you wouldn't be able to do that. I also tried CSV format in an XLS file. So .xls, but CSV format. That's, Obviously, that's a less likely outcome because web apps are going to be generating the content appropriately. This would be one of those really wacky variations where, you, where it's just completely screwed up and you have total control of the file that comes down, which I have seen. Um, so if you manage to get the CSV format in an XLS file, uh, then you don't get a protected view warning, even though it's .xls. Uh, you get a format warning instead, which is a little bit less in-your-face security warning. It just says, this is the wrong format, rather than security warning, which is you know, the banner at the top. Um, a couple of other warnings that disappear as well. Um, downside with this again, you know, that's not, they're not going to be trusted. Because you're not hitting the button to say, I trust this, this has come from the internet, I trust this, it's not going to be remembered. So depending on where you're going with this, that, there may be some um, disadvantages to that as well as advantages. So we've talked about the first two sort of sets of warnings, why you get them, where they come from, um, how they might uh, sort of disappear if you're in, 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 in certain circumstances, particularly when, you're sort of when the, the same file is encountered. What about that cmd.exe warning? Um, well, you could use some built-in functions. Instead of, instead of trying to do um, the DDE trick, there may be some other fun that you can have with built-in functions within the Excel which will just, which will just run. You know? um, so this one's quite well known, you know, the, the idea of uh, equals hyperlink. Um, so that's a, that's a formula that you, can, that you can put in a cell which will create a formula um, and will steal data uh, if you click the link. Um, you can also, there is limited information about the system available through other um, uh, Excel um, sort of directives like info directory, um, um, we, you know, we'll get you the current uh, directory, etc. But to be honest, there's not an awful lot of exciting data there. Um, web service URL is a, relatively new in the, I think it's 2013 that was introduced. Um, sadly, it doesn't support authentication because that might have been fun because that will automatically go and grab a URL. So it might be fun if you then be able to sort of say, "Oh, you need um, you need credentials for this," and you know, see where you can go with uh, uh, with that. It also is pretty strict on the um, on 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 what this URL is. You know, you've tried putting in file paths and backslash backslash to see whether it will connect, but it, it's not it's not having it. Uh, so it looks fairly locked down. The one thing that is interesting about it is that it will do this attack without someone clicking on a link. So without you, without anyone sort of clicking, it will send data out just automatically. So that's a sort of an, an extra plus. Um, the only other thing that I could see was filter XML. Um, now everyone knows that XML parsing is really hard to get right. Um, you'd hope that they, you know, that they would do a good job. Um, I'm sure other people have looked at it. It's 
you know, way too big a surface area for me to have a look at. Um, I was sort of concentrating on other things. So maybe there are some, some, some bugs there to be found. Um, don't know of any, but um, it was just an, an interesting uh, target. So back to using, um, so, so calling executables. Um, we've got this cmd.exe. What about, is there anything that we, could, that we could get it to call which would be a little bit less, perhaps, in your face than cmd.exe, a little bit less, uh, would it be a little bit softer to, on the eye to the user and go, oh, yeah, I know what that is. That's fine, you know. Um, so something I noticed during testing was that, um, so, for example, equals PowerShell, um, uh, as an example, was coming up with remote data not accessible. Do you want to start the application? PowerShe, which sounds like some kind of superhero. Um, but as you can see, it's just that been abbreviated. So it's this sort of 8.3 format that now I have heard other people that haven't had this problem so but yet I've tested it on different platforms in version of Excel 32 bit 64 bit and I've uh, you know seen it quite a lot so I don't know quite what what's going on there but it's something to be if it, but at the end of the day if it's happened on my system it can happen on someone else's so it's something to be you know to, to be wary of that if you start putting in um, uh, other commands in here that you might actually end up falling foul of them because they're too, they're too long and you end up trying to run something which doesn't exist. So I did have a little poke about for um, in executables that were um, you know, eight characters um, you know, plus .exe um, and uh, you know, there's still plenty of interesting things you could do. You, know, you, you can basically just you know, get the browser to, um, to, to go to an arbitrary URL, schedule tasks, um, run some Java, um, you know, open executables another way. But the thing is about this is that it's, this is still, if you think about the original problem where it was trying to make a, a, a DDE call in DDE land that was failing and it would run an executable, well, the same thing is still happening. It's still going to say, do you want to run javaws.exe? And probably all of these are going to look a little bit unfamiliar to, to, to users and they're probably still going to go, not sure about this. So whether we've got any further there, probably not. So then I started thinking, well, what, are, what is this DDE business? You know, if we actually were able to call one of these DDE services, then maybe we wouldn't get a warning because it's, it, it, it's called it. So I found this cool, uh, tool called uh, TCL. Um, has someone used this before? Come across this before? Yeah, yeah I mean, I've not really played with it before. And it has this sort of DDE package inside it. You have to call it. So I'm going to run this demo um, now. Um, so I've got cunningly everything pre-scripted. Um, so the first thing, I don't even trust myself to get that bit right. <laughs> um, so you've got to install a package to get it to, to do DDE stuff. So the first thing is to find out what's going on right now. So these are the sort of, um, these are the topics uh, services and, and topics that are, that, are, that are running right now. So now if I fire up Excel and run that again, so you see now that Excel is now one of these, um, one of these services and is exposing certain topics. So this is really just proving the, um, so let's actually just put some data in the Excel spreadsheet first. Um, <laughs> oh no, actually, probably that's is that is that is that about right, Owen? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter what this is. Anyway, you can imagine this is uh, full of data. So um, this is going to show the inter-process communication. So I've got this program here, which is obviously a completely separate process as far as uh, Windows is concerned. Um, so that's, that's now to just pull data out of Excel, um, which actually, to begin with, I thought, oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> if, you're, if you're working on sort of sensitive data on Excel spreadsheets, you don't really realize that it's actually being exposed um, to, um, again, admittedly to the local environment. Obviously, you'd have to have something malicious already running in on the computer to be able to do this, in which case, you know, there, there are plenty of scenarios to, to get this data in other ways. But it's just kind of interesting that it was it, um, available. So, so this is a DDE call. We're making some DDE calls here. We're talking to, the, to Excel, getting some data out. Um, so start experimenting what you could do just, um, you know, with this. 
Using the same box. I've not tried that. Don't know. Don't know. Well, logically, it's not. But what, what's logic got to do with it? <laughs> it have much to do with those two no. So Who knows? You might be right. You might yeah, be right. Because that, that could be a whole other. Thing. Yeah, I've never, never, never tested that. Never tested that. Because I've not really been going at it from the point of view of, of stealing data or anything. I've been trying to get back to can we get an Excel spreadsheet to fire with minimal warnings? Um, so that sort of scenario doesn't really sort of work in my favour, but, um, but yeah, sort of out of interest, something to have a play with. What kind of privileges do you need to have this um, tool? Again, I've not really played with like, running this as a low-level user or anything like that because I'm only using this as a tool to get to an endpoint. So I've not actually tried to do that. Um, I don't know whether it would. I, don't, I would imagine that you, I don't think you'd, you'd need any privileges. I think that's part of what it's about. It's inter-process communication. So I would be surprised if you needed um, admin to, to, to do this. I wouldn't have thought so either. So I've just run a command there. And as you can probably guess what's, uh, what's happened there, that's now been overwritten. Um, so this is kind of interesting to me, just from the point of view, remember we were talking about a template. We, that when, you're, when you're downloading a, a, a spreadsheet um, and the, there, there are certain fields that you have control of as a user, and other bits that you don't. Well, if you can make DDE calls, you can actually control any part of the spreadsheet, um, which is, you know, you could get up to some mischief there, you could, you know, misrepresent things, but I just sort of parked that there as a scenario. Not quite where we're going, but just an interesting um, observation. So here's another one. So here we have a file, which is just, just got hello in it. Let's run this. So imagine that as a sort of DDE um, call. Go back to our command prompt. Not there. So now I'm starting, I'm starting to think, this, is, this could be getting interesting now. I'm getting Excel to perform file system commands. Can I get it to do OS commands, etc.? So Excel is now, hello, hello world. Let's just go back to that. So this is actually a, a macro, an Excel macro, but this is pre-VBA day. This is how old this technology is. It's some sort of language, I think it's called um, XLM. Um, so this is before uh, Microsoft decided to do macros you know, in, in, in VBA, in Visual Basic. Um, so there's a whole other language just to running macros. This is, I, I, sold, I told you that DDE and all this kind of stuff was really old and where we're going with this. Um, um, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be anything that can get to... Although, although in XLM there, d there are commands that will run commands, sorry, there are sort of functions that will run commands, they don't seem to work <laughs> using this, which is, I don't know whether it's something I'm doing, it's kind of frustrating. And part of the problem with this is that there's absolutely no documentation <laughs> whatsoever on the internet, probably because, you know, Basically, this pre-existed the internet, so, um, so there's no documentation anywhere. Uh, it's been really tough just finding out little bits like uh, little bits like this. Does that macro work if you have macro disabled on the spreadsheet? Um, Can you run the DDE macros on the internet? The DDE, I um, don't know actually. Um, Why? Yeah, I could try that. Um, I, I'm going to go with the flow uh, right now, and then we can also just have a go afterwards. Um, because it is a different kind of macro language, but whether it's in the security setting, it's, it's, still, it's still remembered that it's got XLM. It could be one of those things that they've long forgotten about. Who knows? I think they're definitely worth sort of having a, having a go, but I'm just going to sort of roll with it for now. Um, so that's our... So this is just showing this basic idea of what's going on. Inter-process communication. If we can make DDE calls... Um, then, then we, won't start, we won't be getting warnings like, do you really want to do this that looks strange? And we might get some interesting um, side effects. So just for completeness, I've put that, put that on the slides. I don't know where these slides are going to go. Um, but it's a shame this doesn't work. So this is a XLM, I think it is the, the, the language, you know, which, which you know, should work. This is what it, you, know, you used to be able to do in, 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 the, in Excel macros. But if you try that, it doesn't work. Um, maybe I haven't quite got quite the, you know, the syntax quite right. I don't, you know, I don't know. If you could get that working, things could get, you know, start getting interesting. Maybe it blocks it because it's thinking, why would you need to calculate your in Excel? 
I doubt. What's up the hill? Yeah. yeah. It looks yeah. like you're trying to write yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, It looks like you're trying to use a calculator in Excel. Just go away and have a think about that. <laughs> um, so what about these other sort of uh, DDE services? There was the, uh, Excel, Excel is the one we've been playing with, but there were some other ones. Progman, folders, shell. Uh, again, documentation pretty scant. Um, Progman seems to sort of control shortcuts and things, so if you run that command, uh, you can start to, you can populate people's um, start menus with bogus programs. Um, folders programs, uh, if you like, the uh, Explorer. So you can get it to, to pop open uh, and connect off to different IPs where, you know, if you've got something like Responder, you could, you could capture the network um, NTLM, net NTLM v2 traffic and have a go at cracking passwords, etc., or get up to some other mischief. So this is starting to look interesting, and I thought, well, hang on, if, if I can't do this in Excel, this is pointless. I mean, you know, if I can do this in this program, great. If, if we can't get these things to work as in Excel, then, then we're, we're stuck. And this is where things got a bit depressing. <laughs> um, I'm just basically taking you through this little bit of research, research I was doing. So um, let's take this line and run it in um, TCL. So you can see that has told using this folders um, service, which is sort of connected to the to the Windows graphical shell to go to see Windows, and that's just you know pop that up. So in Excel, I would have thought. Now there's a little tip here, which is actually in the slides, that when TCL is running, it seems to really sort of screw up the DDE calls between um, Excel and other. DDE servers. Don't know why, um, but there you go. It could save you hours <laughs> if you do have a look, start having a play around with this. So you'll be wondering, why is Excel hanging? It's because TCL is running. So if I put that in there and click go, we've got nothing. Nothing's happened. Um, and again, maybe I've got the syntax slightly wrong. Um, you know, there's an element of guesswork here. You know, I've obviously tried playing around with these, just chopping bits out, rearranging things, and I, I've not got it to do you know, what I want it to do. Um, so having a bit more of an explore, I found that what TCL was reporting as being sort of ready and listening in DDE land wasn't quite complete. And I used this thing called DDE Spy, which is part of Visual Studio 6. <laughs> and you can tell by that lovely interface. You know, as I said, we're, we're going back quite a few years uh, here. So I had that as a sort of listening and running, and I was firing things up. And I saw that Firefox and Internet Explorer were registering DDE services. And I thought, oh, OK, that's interesting. Don't know why they didn't appear uh, in, uh, in the, the TCL DDE package. And they're appearing here. I don't know. Um, and these strings were popping out, um, which looked like um, uh, topics, uh, functions, if you like. So let's try one of these in... Now, I'm not connected to the internet here, so this will, uh, this will fail miserably. But bang, just copied, copied that in, boom, straight away, it's, there's the um, IE, and it's gone, off to that, gone after that page. So there is something there, there's something there to play with. Now, that won't call, as you saw, when I pasted that in, it didn't say, do you want to do this? It just did it. And that's because you know, it made a DDE call and, and it worked. So it didn't, it didn't have anything to, else to run. So we've got no uh, warning three, you know, no remote data not accessible. Um, and of course, you, know, you can have fun with, with, with that in many ways. Um, other things you can do, you can, you can actually use um, uh, Internet Explorer to, to navigate to a UNC path and, and get up to that net NTLM v2 mischief that we uh, talked about earlier. Uh, and then I thought, well, could you get it to sort of run commands? And then I started falling over because then we started getting pop-ups again, uh, no better than where we were, and you can't specify switches in, in, in this format. Um, it's a limitation of this file protocol. Um, uh, so you know, you're not going to really get anything done that's uh, particularly exciting there. So I sort of abandoned that one. So Firefox has a similar um, API, if you like, want of a better word. Um, it's quite sort of, well, in, in, with, with the Internet Explorer, this would have worked. Uh, in Firefox, it doesn't work. That doesn't work, but that does. So that's critical, that forward slash at the end. 
Um, so it's just about getting, and this is where I started thinking, you know, I'm getting the syntax wrong with the other things, you know. I haven't found it yet. Um, one of the interesting um, things it exposes is this get window info. So if you, and there's a screenshot here, instead of having to flick back to the, uh, the laptop all the time. So here I've got Firefox open. There's a tab that's open. There's a background tab that's open. Um, if I run this um, in, uh, in, in Excel, it populates the cell with where I am. Um, but only the active tab. Um, so another good reason not to have sensitive data in, in the URL, um, even when it's HTTPS, because people can nick it. <laughs> so that's Firefox. So another demo. I think this is the last one. Um, oh no, I need to be on here. Okay, so let's go back to web app export uh, of spreadsheets. So this is a monthly report. This is normal, nothing funny going on here. Let's save it. Um, save it to the downloads folder. And which I've already got. There's monthly report.csv. Open it up. Now I downloaded that from the internet, but got no protected view warning. You know, it didn't say, you know, are you sure about this? Um, but there's nothing else exciting going on, and this is literally just you know CSV numbers. So that's why nothing else has, has, has popped up. But there's no no protected view warning there. Is that not because you've downloaded it from local? Uh, no, you shouldn't get it anyway. Um, and you shouldn't get it anyway. <clears throat> right. Let's get. Now this is a malicious one. That is a bit malicious. So we'll just overwrite that and run this. So now we're getting a warning uh, because there's something funny going on. So we'll enable that content. So we've enabled that. We've got no other warning. It hasn't come up and said, do you want to run this, that, and the other? Uh, and in that suspiciously blank cell is that. So it's navigated me in the background. And if I go back to Firefox, I've actually got what could be a pretty good phishing attack here. Because you know, if you imagine I was on the export page for this application, and I did an export, opened it, I go back to my browser, and I've got a tab which says I'm logged out, and I need to put in my username and password. So that could be a really good way of stealing, stealing creds. I think that has a real you know, uh, genuine sort of impact to it. You, know, you could see that actually working. Um, and that's without any other warnings. So uh, actually, if I go back and do the last one, now for this, I'm just going to get this working. Responder. Uh, save that file. And open it. Oh, there it is. And there you go. So I've got a hash. And now that is just doing a very similar thing, but just you know pointing to a UNC path instead. So there's something quite, you know, it's just that's something quite similar. So I'm just abusing the same idea to to get a different result. Now if I find the actual presentation. Let's go through those three uh, examples. So no protective view warning because it was a CSV file. Um, we got the enable content warning only because um, we had a, a proper DDE call, so it didn't have anything else to, to, to run. I think that could be quite, uh, quite effective given the context that we're talking about, you know, web app export. If you sort of bounced off to a convincing looking phishing site, you could see someone really could think, oh, okay, I've logged me out. I'll just log back in. You've got their creds. Um, <coughs> And number three, we've got no warnings whatsoever. Now, this is pretty unlikely probably in real life, but it was just a bit of fun to engineer. Um, so exactly which stars were aligned there in order for me to get a net, NV, net um, NTLM v2 uh, exchange uh, for me to have a go with, um, uh, with Hashcat or whatever. So a file with the same name was previously downloaded. That's quite possible, monthly report um, .xls uh, in this case. Um, it had previously had content you know, to, for me to, to trust it, to say, yes, I'm, I'm happy with this. Yes, I'm happy with this. 
Um, and then the malicious file um, has, a, has a startup prompt set to auto-update links. Now, that's obviously not something I can control through a, through a web app. So, realistically, that, this kind of thing would be more likely, you know, you're sending someone a, um, a spreadsheet. Um, but it was just a bit of fun to, uh, to, to engineer it, really. In reality, I guess, you might, ha you might miss, you'll probably miss the protected view warning. You'll miss the yellow banner saying, uh, security warning, do you want to um, enable links? What you might get is, do you want to update the links, which is, it doesn't come up as a security banner. Um, um, so, you know, whether you get through that, all depends on the user. But just a bit of fun, really. So this has been around for a couple of years, this idea. Um, and so you still see it a lot, actually. Generally speaking, this, this, gen this works. If you see uh, an export function to, um, to Excel, it, uh, it usually does work. Um, the original article stated uh, that, you, that was, um, if you should prefix cell starting with an equals with an apostrophe. And that casts the cell as text in XLS. The nice thing about that is that you don't see the apostrophe as well. So you, you, you get the original field, it's just treated as text, and that's a nice way of sort of disabling the, the DDE call. If you've got CSV, then um, it will stop the, the execution of the DDE call, but you'll still get, you know, you'll get an apostrophe there, which doesn't look very nice. Now we know better with this, as, as often happens with, with attacks, that you get new, new attack vectors. So imagine that someone's looked at the original device or just heard about it and just thought, okay, right, we just need to sort of sort out this, this equals a bit. If something starts with equals and there's a letter which suggests that you've got some kind of function, let's just, you know, get rid of it. Well, there's plenty of ways to get, rid of, get around that. So while that would fail, which is our original attack, all these would work and, you know, bypass, bypass that. So there are plenty of ways to poke about and, and try and get things working. Here, we're just doing it by having a uh, a number, but you don't even need the equal sign. There are other ways of, 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 of doing that. Um, some of these may be context dependent, uh, not played exhaustively with different formats, and, um, but I know these do work in at least one, one case. And the point is, you know, blacklists are dangerous. So if you do encounter s some uh, suspicious um, behavior in the sense that your, your input's being rejected, then um, it may be a way that you can, you, you can get around it because they've got a, a filter in place. So what are the lessons here? If you see Excel export, dig it, dig in it. You know, you might, I don't know to what extent this is um, sort of new material to you. I know sort of um, when I've done this before, I've had many people come up and say, oh, I didn't know about that. And I've since had emails saying, um, you know, what was that, what was that payload again? And, and et cetera. So um, it's certainly new for some people, even though it's a couple of years old. Um, we're exposed to so much new stuff all the time, it gets forgotten about. So that's um, definitely worth having a, having a poke with. Um, CSV is not a benign format, you know, you can have fun with a CSV and DDE is not a macro, so even if people are protecting themselves by not running macros, you still might have a, uh, be able to get around that. Blacklists may not be robust, you might be able to get around it, as, as we've seen, and much of this applies to red teaming. I've, you know, I've tried to focus on the, the scenario where you're, uh, you, you've got a web app, uh, it's got Excel export, your job is to look at the security of that and you're reporting on that. But if you're, in, if you're doing red teaming and phishing and la la and you're sending spreadsheets to people uh, by, by email, then a lot of this uh, could have some uh, import. And we've seen in some cases it is possible to cut down the Excel uh, warnings, but very much work in progress. You know, I've managed to sort of to cut it down with some limited sort of fun, if you like, um, with, with, uh, with the Internet Explorer or um, uh, Firefox, for example. So where now? Um, Probably trying to enumerate this surface area a bit more, you know, what these service topics and, and items, as I said, it's very poorly documented. Um, by just sort of doing some, some strings on the, uh, on the topic names, um, this is where the Internet Explorer sort of um, DDE um, calls initially go to. Firefox is there, and the Progman shell folders um, lives in here. So these are the files that are, um, that are, that are doing the work. These are quite attractive as targets for, for DDE because they're always running. That's the thing. Similarly, if you do find something to exploit in Excel, maybe using that XLM macro if you can get it to work, um, then that's a good one because you know Excel, they're opening it in an Excel document, so you know that that's going to be running. Similarly, because the Windows graphical shell is always you know, running when, when people are going to be using things like Excel, they, they're attractive targets um, to, to get. But the point is, can they be exploited in Excel? And, and I, I put an example here where I could get something running in a, using an, a proper native DDE client, but when I try to sort of adapt it 
to, to what I hoped would work as, as an Excel cell, it didn't work, sadly. So, you know, I had a bit of a play to say, is there something about the characters here? Is there something, is it, this is it, is it Excel's doing or, or what? So I knew that this worked. I knew that I could open an arbitrary <coughs> sort of URL. So I just fired in, you know, the kind of things that I was trying to pass in uh, to the uh, folders service. I just put in as a, as a parameter here on this, uh, in, in, in the URL. And where it went to was up to here. Um, so what I found by playing around with this is that URL style characters were, were accepted. So, um, you know, if I put in, as you can already tell, because, I, you know, I've got a dot here, you know, I've got a question mark through here, and, and Internet Explorer was directed to the, this URL successfully. So that's kind of making sense. And this, kind of, this suggests that Internet Explorer itself is, is looking at the, what's coming in and going, I'm not happy with that, I'm happy with that, this looks like a URL, okay. Um, so that was kind of interesting. And it, this was kind of co confirmed by, playing, by doing exactly the same thing with Firefox where I got a completely different result. It's sort of suggesting that the same data is going to the service, but the service itself is, is then performing some input validation, as you would hope, you know, being into process communication, that, that, that it will be looking at this untrusted data and going, does this look like a URL? Does this, you know, what's going on here? So this gave me a little bit of hope that maybe, you know, I was getting the syntax wrong. Just for the hell of it, I ran an equals CMD, uh, which we know also runs, with this entire string, uh, which is echoing it out, and it did echo it out. Don't, not too sure whether that's really quite representative, because we, we know that this isn't a, D, a proper DDE call. I, you know, I just know that Excel is handling that and, and passing it, but you know, maybe that's a little bit unrepresentative. When it get, you get to a point, and if you've ever sort of poked about, and particularly where there's absolutely no documentation, you're thinking, feeling like I'm hitting a bit of a brick wall here, why is that? Is it because of this or this? So am I sort of poking around up here, and there is in fact a little hole here that I haven't found yet, or is in fact the entire thing solid <laughs> and I'm never going to get there? And that is of course the, the, the gamble of R&D when you, when you, when you um, give up. Um, so you know, I don't know whether um, I have hit a brick wall, because of this or because of this. Um, the, as you can see, the, the main, one of the big problems is that, is that syntax, getting it, which is a bit thorny, is just trying to get, get, get the, the, the correct syntax um, into um, sort of the Excel uh, payload. So it wouldn't be fair to sort of have a um, security talk without talking about defense. We know that blacklists can be difficult to get right. Um, there shouldn't be a new lesson at all because of cross-site scripting as a prime example. We should always be going for a strict whitelist of known good. Uh, it should always be our go-to defense strategy. You know, consider the length of the input you're expecting, uh, the character, character types, the, the format, you know, the, you know, so, you know, the relative positions of char character types. So a good example is, um, is a phone number, which I've mentioned before, because that could have a plus at the front of it. So we might put a plus in the front of it. And we know that pluses are a way of doing DDE calls. But then after the plus, you're always expecting a number um, or maybe a, a bracket with a, with a zero or something like that. It's fairly well sort of established what that format is. So there shouldn't really be any problem in hardening what you're expecting to be a, a telephone field. Otherwise, if you're talking about export for XLS and X, just always prefix the user input with this apostrophe. Don't, don't go, if it's this, do this. Just always do this. Um, this, is, this will break some uh, functions that work on that cell, particularly numerical operations, because by prefixing it with that, you're saying this cell is text. So if you're trying to do a numerical um, uh, um, operation on it, it may just balk. But then if you're expecting a number, well, you know, do this right instead. So the, you know, this can't be quite successful. The trouble with that is that if you are dealing with CSV, you're gonna, it's a bit ugly, you'll get something ugly. Uh, in, the, in the cell itself, you'll have this apostrophe. But maybe better that than you know, something launching. If you absolutely must, 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 must use a blacklist, you know, which is, you really don't want to if you, if you can help it, but sometimes you've got to, don't be too strict about it. In the vast majority of cases, the normal input, what, you, what people are generally writing in these fields isn't going to look anything like a DDE call or, or a formula. And remember, we've got to cover formula as well. The Excel formula is not just DDEs, it's formulae as well. I mean, there's some suggestions as a, as a starter. I mean, have a play with that um, and, and you know, test it against a few cases. 
It certainly works against the, the cases that are in the slide a few slides ago. I'm not saying they're bulletproof at all, but it's just something to, to start with. So that's it. Um, tip of the hat to a few people there I've nicked ideas from and, uh, and just sort of pushed forward. Um, that's it, really. So does anybody have any questions on any of that? Thank <laughs> you.